So it's a great pleasure to introduce Ron Beavis today, and please sit down. Um, so um, Ron and I have uh, known each other for a very long time and collaborated since the uh, mid '90s. Um, and uh, actually, so then Ron was here at NYU at that point. At, he was one of the first members of the Skirball Institute. Uh, so he's sort of coming back, giving a lecture here at the Skirball. Um, so uh, then, so Ron, uh, his background is in physics and zoology, um, and he has worked uh, a lot with developing uh, algorithms and uh, methods to analyze uh, uh, mass spectrometry data. And uh, uh, so today he's going to talk about uh, uh, sequence variants and how he integrates uh, uh, genomic data with, uh, uh, with proteomics data. Well, thank you very much, David. Uh, is my uh, mic coming through okay? Okay, good. Uh, yes, as David said, uh, it's kind of old home week for me to be here at uh, NYU for, for a week because uh, Tom graciously arranged for an apartment in the upper four floors of the Skirball building where I used to live when I was here. And I used to be, be the the guy who originally sat in Tom's chair upstairs. And when I, when I arrived, there were only like three or four other groups that were actually active in the building. So I was through a phase where, you know, even the individual faculty members were all assigned some sort of uh, mechanical system in the building and we had to make sure it worked. I was the guy in charge of the uh, the reverse osmosis water system. So I spent a whole bunch of time on the sixth floor, which is the mechanical area, listening to endless complaints from the zebrafish guys how it was the water that was causing problems with their experiments, not their experiments. <laughs> I don't know if, if those guys are still here, but I hope everything got sorted out. They're all gone. They're all gone? <laughs> okay. Still I, about water. <laughs> okay. Well, what I'm going to talk to you about today is some work that I've uh, been doing uh, kind of on and off since about 2006, 2007, uh, trying to understand how the uh, changes in knowledge in the human genome, and particularly the, pos the, uh, the changing knowledge of populations of uh, base nucleotide-based variants, how that affects how we should look at proteomics data and whether there's anything in proteomics data that can be useful for people who are doing uh, large-scale uh, sequencing, both RNA-seq, uh, genome-wide association studies, and whole genome studies. And hopefully by the end of it, I'll, I'll convince you that, uh, yes, we can use the information but that, from them, but hopefully we can uh, also provide them with some biochemical insight into the results of their studies. So um, for anyone who has primarily worked in proteomics, you're probably not that familiar with how nucleotide variants are named and how they're accumulated in databases and repositories. So I'll spend a few minutes uh, talking about just about the basics of how you deal with nucleotide variants and how that links in with uh, protein variants. The, the granddaddy of all these resources is called dbSNP. It was set up at NCBI, I think, in 1998. Uh, the, the first build had 14 SNPs in it. And the, uh, the task of dbSNP has changed significantly over the years. It was originally supposed to be a repository of relatively common uh, nucleotide variants in the population. But as with most things, um, in order to get funded, you have to show numbers. So they have, to various degrees, uh, tried to balance sensitivity, which is how many you actually get into the, uh, into the repository, versus specificity, which is how good quality the, uh, the results are. And it's kind of gone up and down. They've 
they've been criticized sometimes, praised at other times. Fundamentally, though, every um, nucleotide variant that goes into dbSNP gets a, uh, a reference SNP number, R, RS, and now they're really quite long numbers. Uh, it started at RS1 and just will continue and as it gets bigger and bigger. Um, dbSNP does not simply store single nucleotide variants, which is how you say uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms these days. The, the, the word uh, polymorphism is less frequently used, and I'm going to try and stick with saying variants as often as possible, because that way it distinguishes it from you have a reference sequence, then you have some variants. It doesn't really matter whether those variants are frequent in the population or never exist in the population. They're just differences from the reference. So you're not making any value or disease-related judgments about them. But in addition to the single nucleotide variants where it started off, now it contains a number of different types of variants, uh, each of which obtain an RS number and are stored in their system. Uh, one other, th and at the moment, the the type of variant that's the most use in uh, in proteomics is what's what's now referred to as a missense variant, which used to be called a non-synonymous polymorphism, but it means it's one that changes an amino acid codon so that you know an A becomes a B or a B becomes an L. So missense variants are what I'm going to be talking about mainly today. And if you look across the, all the splice variants that are, that are currently cataloged for human, that ends up being about 3 million uh, 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 missense variants that, that we have to play with in proteomics. Now actually, naming uh, both nucleotide and amino acid variants uh, can be actually quite difficult because you're always doing things relative to some sort of accession number that you have for something. You know, you've got, let's say, a Swiss broad accession number and you want to name the variant. You've got an ensemble accession number and you want to name the variant. And the uh, Human Genome Variation Society uh, came up with a rather nice way to specify uh, nucleotide and uh, amino acid variants, and that's what I'm going to use throughout the talk, so I'll go through how it works a little bit. It, it's actually very simple. On the polynucleotide side, for a, uh, a single nucleotide variant, first you write the accession number for the nucleotide you, you're interested in, then an identifier which tells you whether it's a, a genome, cDNA, or R, RNA, then you put in the coordinate of the nucleotide that's changing, the nucleotide that will change, and the variant. So this X here is the reference and Y is the variant. They have a very similar system for proteins where you have an accession number and, and then an identifier. In the case of, of proteins, it's only P. The reference uh, amino acid X the coordinate of X on the protein, and then the variance uh, amino acid. And this actually turns out to make the whole, the whole world a lot simpler, especially for somebody like me who has databases of these things. And it's, it can be tricky to describe using some of the, uh, the older style systems. I, I found this to be a great simplification in this area. So for example, if you have uh, one particular RS number, you can say that it starts on chromosome 22 of the genome, big long position on the, on the chromosome, then you have a G changing to an A. If you have uh, an RNA-CDNA sequence, you put down the accession number for, the, for that, C for CDNA, the coordinate, and then a C to a T. And for protein, same thing, an ensemble number, P, A at 1305 to V. 
So it's quite simple, and you can adapt it to any coordinate system, uh, any accession number system that you want to use. Now, the missense variants uh, and variants in general have a large number of ways of impacting a mature protein over and above just the protein sequence. At the genome level, uh, the variants can alter regulatory regions and alter the uh, starter end sites of uh, transcription. Once you've produced a primary transcript, they can remove existing splice sites or add new splice sites, uh, causing the, uh, the message to change. Once you've got a message, then they can have resulted in uh, changes in, in stops so the, the, uh, RNA, the messenger RNA surveillance system kicks in and if, let's say, there's, uh, there is no stop in the message now or there are too many stops in the message, so you've got nonsense mediated decay, uh, the RNA gets discarded at that point. So everything up to here can result in uh, in RNA simply being discarded, and even though the gene is still in the genome and just and looks just fine, by the time it gets to the RNA level, it may be discarded. Once that's directly turned into the protein, uh, well, into the into the nascent subunit peptide, in fact, there can be several mechanisms by which uh, those polypeptides are discarded if they uh, contain a variant. If it leads to uh, faulty p uh, PTM um, or folding changes to the uh, the protein that's supposed to be there, then they can simply be tagged with ubiquitin and thrown in thrown in the molecular wood chipper that is the proteasome. So many of these uh, many variants can result in these individual things, but the things I'm currently interested in and the things that we can deal with in proteomics, because these are, these are all very serious consequences. If you totally lose the protein, that's bad. However, if you just partially lose it, let's say it does, it's not so much that it misfolds, but it's less likely to fold into the right shape, then you will just reduce the number of uh, uh, protein chains made from the original allele. So you can have effects where you have the change here, but you actually end up with fewer uh, uh, protein molecules from that particular allele caused by one of the, this sort of mechanism, one of these mechanisms or other mechanisms. So on the uh, level of people who do uh, proteomics, the most important thing is is the mature protein, but you, even if you have a heterozygous individual, you aren't always going to get a one-to-one uh, -one concentration of the um, variant allele and the reference allele. Now, um, it turns out that amino acid variants are reasonably common in proteomics data. Uh, if you look at a typical proteomics experiment, this is uh, data from uh, one particular large human proteomics experiment. About 13% of the identified peptides had oxidation, 7.5% contained deamidation, and both of these are experimental artifacts. Then you get down into the biologically significant modifications like acetylation at about 3%. Then single amino acid variants caused by nucleotide uh, variants is, ab is about 1.5%. Phosphorylation about 1%. And then the, uh, the lesser seen modifications like dimethylation and ubiquitinylation um, are significantly less than 1% and that's sort of typical experiments that people do. But um, single amino acid variants hold pretty commonly somewhere between 1% to 
of the identified peptides. And if you look at the statistics uh, from the population, you'd expect there to be a variant about every 1,500 uh, unique residues that you find. Uh, so, you know, once every about 1,500 residues, there should be a variant. And that ends up giving you about 1% of the identified peptides having a variant. So it's not unexpected. The proteomics results line up quite nicely with the, with the known populations. But it's something that people don't often check for. Uh, and since it's only 1%, it's not as though it, it really harms you so much. But there's this additional <coughs> valuable information that, that people could be uh, more frequently making available in their papers. However, one of the reasons that people don't check for it is because it's actually kind of tricky to find these things because they're rare, um, they're su fairly subtle modifications, and they tend to be mass differences for those of you who are interested in proteomics, which I guess is probably most of the crowd. The, the mass changes that you get tend to be, you know, a methyl group, so plus 14, an ethyl group. Uh, you get mass differences that are also dangerously close to artifacts that you might see from your sample preparation. So you have to be quite careful about it. But from a calculational point of view, um, it can be quite challenging to calculate. Uh, I'm going to go through a couple of different methods that have been used in the past and end up with the one that I currently use, so that, that'll be the, the champion. But the, uh, the simplest way to do it, and what I started using, uh, was just to go brute force. You take a peptide that looks like uh, where the reference peptide is on the top, and then you just go through and systematically change out one residue at a time for all of, it, all of the 18 possible variants that you've got. Because there are a couple of isobaric uh, residues, you've only got 18 rather than the usual 20. So that means if you do it in the first column, you've got uh, uh, 18 additional calculations, then you switch over to the next column, and so on. And for a peptide like this that's 27 residues long, it means you do 485 additional calculations to try and check to see if you can find a, uh, a variant. Now you can cut down that uh, number of uh, calculations quite a bit because not all amino acids can be uh, changed from another because of a single nucleotide variant. There's a, a limited number of possibilities and when you figure that out it turns out that on average you've got about six extra variants per, uh, uh, per residue and for 27 more like this, it's about 160 calculations. So it's still a lot of calculations. So these, uh, these two brute force sort of calculations, they have the, the advantage for somebody who develops algorithms that they're really simple to write. Uh, there's, there's nothing easier to do. They do do a very thorough analysis. But you end up doing almost all the calculations on things that are extremely unlikely to be true. And that um, I refer to as, as uh, over-modeling because you give these very unlikely solutions a tremendous number of chances to, uh, to simply match at random. And that, that sort of thing can happen and you have to be very, very stringent about accepting a variant as being true. Because as I said, it only happens in about 1% of cases. Uh, it's somewhat better when you're only looking for the single nucleotide variants, but still, you are uh, doing over 100 calculate. You're doing over 100 calculations on things that are extremely rare, and it means buying a lot of extra computers to find something at 1%, and that's kind of unsatisfactory for most people. Uh, another method that people have used, which, uh, which does work, is to use uh, multi-entry FASTA files for the protein sequences. So in a case like this, uh, 
you have the original reference sequence for a, a protein here, and then you take all of the uh, known missense variants and just change them in the, the second variant sequence. So you change the S to, to an A, an R to a K, and mark the uh, accession number so you know that this is one that contains variants. And that uh, works quite nicely. It, it does double the amount of calculations that you have to do, but it's, it's fairly straightforward to do so long as you've got some good bioinformatics people who can actually make all those changes and make sure they're all correct. Uh, the, al the alternate method that uh, I've settled on is to have two files where you have a FASTA file that has the sequence, then you actually have an annotation file that has the, um, just has each one of the variants marked in it, and then at runtime, when you have a peptide that contains the variant, you check the reference in the variant peptide. So rather than having to run through the entire sequence again, the only peptides that you additionally test are the ones that actually contain the variant. And that's computationally the most, um, uh, it's the most efficient and it's, uh, it, however, has the disadvantage that um, somebody actually has to have changed the search engine to be able to do that. So if you're using the fast day editing approach, you can effectively use any of the algorithms that are currently available. Uh, it's significantly faster than the brute force approach. Uh, it's a little less efficient than just a factor of two because if you've got more than one alternate, uh, um, if you've got more than one uh, single amino acid variant at a particular position, which does happen from time to time, you have to, to double the number, well, you have to add an additional sequence. And you have to do some additional uh, po post-processing to map those amino acid variants back onto the single nucleotide variants that they come from. Uh, the method that, I'm, that I've currently settled on, the FASTA plus an annotation file, it's the fastest to compute. You don't have to do any additional processing because the, the algorithm keeps track of uh, the R, the uh, the RS number for you or whatever accession numbers you're using for the variants. And it has no problem dealing with multiple uh, amino acid variants. However, it does require code level changes, uh, which means you've got to have a motivated programmer to make it work. Yes? Um, so, do, I'm sorry, do you, do you look for the variant um, if you identify a protein that has the variant or a peptide that has the variant? Uh, you look for the, you you look for the variants um, just in the way you normally do a uh, just in the way the search engine would normally run and would cut the thing up into uh, triptych peptides, then compare the triptych peptides back against the, the spectra that you have. And if a particular triptych peptide has one of these variants, it tries both the the reference sequence and the variant sequence. No, that, that's that's done by the algorithm. So what, when it runs across uh, this particular uh, coordinate, you know, position 14 in this particular protein, it real it knows that um, there's a variant there, so it should check the peptide with both the reference and the variant sequence. So it's not an question. No, it's a separate annotation file. Right. You know, if, if you could figure out some cl clever way to do that, then. Yeah. So this 
I mean, this method has the disadvantage that you really do have to make sure that all the alignments are correct. So when you when you version to a new FASTA file, you know, a new version of your genome comes out or something like that, you do have to make sure that you uh, change the annotation file so that you've got all the coordinates correct. Yes. No, it, it doesn't have to hit the peptide first. It, it goes through and checks the possibilities. That was my question. Okay. And, and, in, and in fact, that, that does happen because there are uh, quite a few nucleotide variants that are called ancestral, which means they're actually, the, uh, they're actually far more likely to be in the population than the original reference sequence was. So you, you do run across that. And actually, the, the reason I came up with this was uh, I got annoyed by a couple of proteins where I was missing, where by using the ensemble sequences, I was missing peptides because of these ancestral uh, variants. Because ensemble uses the reference sequences, and something like SwissProt will use the, the most uh, frequently found in the population sequence. So is that a little bit of wizardry clear now? Yeah. Okay. So uh, one of the main reasons I'm interest, interested in this sort of stuff is I've run a large repository of uh, proteomics results. Um, called GPMDB, and as of today, it's got about 2 billion uh, peptide identifications in it, all from a mass spectrometry-based proteomics. And the way the system works is uh, labs all across the world uh, make their data available in public repositories like Pride, Peptide Atlas, Massive, or Porous. There are a couple of other ones. And uh, there are some X there are some extinct ones like Tranche and Peptidome. And what we do is take these publicly available data sets, uh, often which are associated with publications, so we've got a fairly rich amount of metadata associated with them. And we use the, uh, uh, an offline version of the uh, GPM system, which is a, a um, proteomics data analysis and QAQC system, and we analyze that data. Uh, then the results of those analysis get put into the larger database, GPMDB, on a daily basis. Uh, at the moment, we add somewhere between one to six million new IDs a day, and through a website and uh, some other types of interfaces. We make that information back available to labs so people can look at both their data and other people's data and uh, try to understand what's going on uh, in terms of experimental proteomics. And it's at this point right here where we actually do the amino acid variant checking. So for everything that goes in, we use the 3 million amino acid variants that are currently available from DBSNP and add that into the, the analysis and that gets uh, stored in the database and you can go and look at what amino acid variants have been found. There are some labs that directly use uh, a public version of the uh, GPM system, but by far the most information that's added comes uh, from labs through one of these large repositories. Now, as it turns out, um, I certainly am not the only person interested in uh, variant populations. Uh, recently, it's become uh, quite a, um, it's become quite an important uh, 
uh, type of biological research to go in and actually see what the nucleotide variants look like across larger populations. And for the, the project that's been the most helpful for me is the, uh, the so-called Thousand Genomes Project because it's very similar to uh, the sort of collection that I do where most of the data that's in GPMDB is, has been collected from a large number of different populations, uh, some of its patients, some of its cell lines. Uh, some, most of it is uh, relatively healthy, uh, depending on how you, what you think of um, cell lines as being. But uh, the, the, the large biological project that's going on now that's the, the, the most similar to what to what I'm doing is the thousand genomes. And they've also, you know, made everything available and they've got some very nice services and they're well integrated with uh, various types of sequence repositories. So if you look into the thousand genome project and I just selected a particular variant on uh, myosin heavy chain nine, which is something that everyone who does proteomics is very familiar with. It's one of the you know, big, it's one of the, it's a big protein, there's a lot of it in cells and it responds like crazy. Uh, there's a, a, a particular SNP, RS2269529, which in the uh, HDVS uh, notation is chromosome 22 of the genome. This particular T changes to a Z, to a C on the uh, the RNA level, it's an A to a G, and what they found in their populations is an allele count of about 15,000 T to about 600 C for a, uh, a frequency of observation, well, frequency in the population of 0.72 for T and 0.28 for C. And they have a, uh, some nice breakdowns of what the populations look like in, in the various subpopulations that they've used to do, the, do their analysis. And as you can see, there's actually a considerable amount of variation between the, uh, the summed 72% reference when you go across the, the different populations. Particularly the, the Asian group here is very different from the African group, and that holds for a lot of uh, missense variations. There's, uh, there tends to be larger amounts of uh, variation within, the, within the, the population than there are for uh, synonymous variations. Now if you do the same thing using GPMDB, uh, you've got the same SNP, uh, you've got the somewhat different representation. It's an, an I that changes to a V, so it a loss of about 14 Daltons. That's where it is in the triptych peptide that you use. And if you count up the, the number of triptych peptides that have the reference sequence and the number that have been observed to have the, uh, the variant sequence, you get a frequency of 0 0.8 to 0.2, which is gratifyingly similar to what you'd expect based on the nucleotide uh, population and well within the, uh, the variation that you see across uh, different populations within the Thousand Genome Project. Uh, I should mention, however, that, I mean, this is based on a lot of data. This, this is based on about 300,000 LCMS MS runs. If you are, if you're trying to do this, it's very difficult to get any sort of broad distribution if you're just looking at a single data set or something from a single lab. To see this sort of, to actually get sufficient statistics, because as, as most people who do proteomics know, is you, you often very strongly undersample particular parts of a protein sequence, uh, you really do have to collect a lot of data. Huh. Well, that's nice and distorted. <laughs> the Mac is having its revenge. Um, 
I'll just skip to there. Okay, uh, somehow or another, the uh, the axes and the and everything disappeared. Translating it onto the Mac here, but what this is is a uh, the if the bottom line was showing, uh, this is the uh, fraction of reference. Uh, I mean. <coughs> This is the fraction of the population for the amino acids that contain the reference, and this is the fraction of the SNVs from 1,000 genomes that contain the reference. And as you can see, there's a, a, a fairly, a reasonably good agreement. It's a pretty straight line. So the two, the things do tend to agree. There are, however, a number of significant outliers. And uh, one of the things I'm spending quite a bit of time on at the moment is trying to explain these outliers, group them together to see if we can cluster them and figure out whether there's really a significant difference between the uh, uh, the amount of allele that ends up, the amount of the variant allele that ends up in the protein or whether these are some sort of, whether many of these are easily explained artifacts just caused by the measurement process, either at the nucleotide on the nucleotide side or on the protein side. The other uh, confounder when trying to do any of these comparisons is this is a a more elaborate breakdown of the uh, the nucleotide variant populations, where from a thousand genomes they've got a much more nuanced ability to go in and see exactly which population has which distribution is. And as you can see, for any particular variant, it does kind of go all over the place. Uh, so in some cases, it may simply be that it's, uh, it's difficult to figure out which of these populations corresponds most closely to the observations that we've got on the protein level. But what this also means is that uh, at the moment you can go into uh, GPMDB and you can pull up a page like that for a particular protein, which shows you the uh, the variants that have been detected down here, their corresponding RS numbers, the peptides that they were detected in, the number of times the reference was found, the uh, variant was found the minor allele frequency from 1,000 genomes, and a little diagram that uh, gives you some idea what the protein population is. I mean, as you can see, in some cases, you've got reasonably large numbers of observations, so the statistics are probably pretty good. In other cases, like uh, the, the second line, you've only got two and three observations, so those are still statistically not really particularly valuable. Uh, but you can, yeah, if you have a particular protein of interest and you're interested in studying a, uh, a variant, now you can pull up these distributions and understand what's known and how observable any particular variant is. So if uh, there's, there are currently uh, Variant frequency distributions for about 180,000 of these uh, single amino acid variants corresponding to DB SNP entries. So these are the variants that are uh, are more likely to be seen in the population. They'll have somewhat higher frequencies because a lot of uh, nucleotide variants, their population frequency is pretty close to zero. So those are unlikely to be seen on the proteomic side. As I said, you can uh, directly ask, access these distributions through our website. And at the moment, uh, I'm putting considerable work into trying to rationalize these distributions with what's known on the nucleic acid side. Now, I'll just spend the, uh, the last part of the talk uh, discussing something that uh, I'm actually here in New York to write up a paper with uh, David Fenuel about. So this is work that I've done jointly with his group. 
Um, and the motivation for the uh, the work is that there have been a lot of genome-wide association studies and RNA-seq studies that have been done um, to try and produce either a causal or diagnostic link to a phenotype based on nucleotide variants. However, once they've identified nucleotide variants, um, they're often left behind by, I mean, biochemistry kind of fails them because there hasn't been a lot of characterization of the consequences of allele changes in proteins. You know, you, um, it's simply too difficult for anybody to study every single protein and figure out what happens when you've got particular allele variants. So they're left to more statistical methods uh, rather than biochemical methods. Now, fortunately, however, uh, proteomics is effectively large-scale biochemistry. You know, it is really going in and looking at the, at the proteins and doing it on a larger scale often even though you might have a hypothesis for what it is you're trying to find, there are a whole bunch of other things that get found in there that, that weren't part of your original experiment. You may see a lot of additional phosphorylation sites that you weren't looking for. And one of the advantages of a system like GPMDB is it captures all that stuff and makes it available to you afterwards. And in particular, a lot of people have put a tremendous amount of effort into determining uh, post-translational modifications in proteins in various circumstances. And uh, with the, the well-founded belief that these modifications are usually involved in some sort of biochemical process, whether it's signaling, binding, catalytic activity, whatever. And most of this effort has been put into uh, really three of what people consider to be the most high-value targets for post-translational modification, namely phosphorylation, acetylation, and ubiquitination. Now, the, the hypothesis that we've been working from is that if an amino acid variant that corresponds to the, the nucleotide variant alters a PTM acceptor site, then that amino acid variant, even though it might appear to be something that would cause low risk when you're looking at something like polyphen, uh, may actually generate a much more significant biochemical effect um, simply because it has abolished a ubiquination site, it's abolished a, a, um, a, an acetylation site, or a uh, phosphorylation site. So changing a lysine to an arginine may look rather benign, uh, but if it abolishes an acetylation site, it may actually significantly affect the um, biochemical utility of that particular protein. It may change its um, half-life in the cell. Uh, it may do a variety of different things. Uh, block signaling pathways, uh, change where uh, proteins end up in a cell. It has a lot of potential cha possible changes. Now what we've been doing is taking the fact that GPMDB has a, has a very large amount of this sort of PTM information in it because of all the large-scale phosphorylation, acetylation, and ubiquitination studies. And we can take all this data and we can do an automated curation of the pooled data, which is much stricter than anyone can do on their own publishable data. Because in this case, we're not really so interested in sensitivity. You know, we don't really care so much how many of them we find. We just want to get the really good ones. So we can use criteria like it's got to be found in five studies. And if it, anything that hasn't been found in five studies, we'll just wait until it ends up in five studies, as there is a large amount of data going in all the time. Then, uh, since the system is mainly populated with proteins that, are, uh, that use um, ensemble accession numbers, uh, 
we can directly map these uh, curated set of post-translational modifi modification sites from their protein coordinates directly back onto their genomic coordinates, because Ensemble has a lot of things that make it very easy to do that. So you can go from uh, you know, a phosphorylation at residue 14 and very simply say, okay, that's on chromosome 19 at some long number. <coughs> so you can map, map the codons associated with each one of those acceptor sites. And uh, we've done that. This is a, uh, a single entry for a particular protein uh, where we've gone through and mapped all the, uh, the acetylation sites uh, for this particular protein accession number. And we start for, for this particular ribosomal protein. And we know that there's the acceptor sites at position 13 in the uh, protein sequence, and it's at this set of uh, genomic coordinates uh, in, the, in the particular chromosome, or on chromosome 9 in, in this particular case on the negative strand. So we've got a nice map now of where all of the, uh, the the acetylation sites, phosphorylation sites, and ubiquination sites that have been detected by proteomics, we've got those mapped back onto the genome. Uh, yeah? Are these numbers used to sort of get the exact, these GC numbers, are these the transcripts that are supposed to The GC numbers? Yeah, I mean, the, the coordinates there, so that they can put the actual transcripts in one gene and have the transcripts of isotopes and so they can map the codon. Is that what they did? Yes, okay. and that, that's, that's the thing that Ensemble makes a lot simpler because you can just directly ask it, okay, I've got this amino acid, I've got this amino acid position with this particular protein accession number corresponding to this transcript number. Where does that sit on the, uh, on the chromosome? So actually, it, it's turned out to be uh, kind of sobering because when you map everything back onto the, onto the genome and codons, it's much easier to determine how many real modification sites you have because if you're dealing with a lot of different uh, protein sequences, it can be difficult to keep track of you know, when you're just mapping things on splice variants. So now we've got to, it, it reduced the number of, of uh, kind of unique phosphorylation sites uh, down from about 60,000 to about 40,000 when we did this mapping. I mean, they're, they're still unique in that they're on different splice variants, but if you use the, uh, the genome coordinates as a measure of uniqueness, then it, it's very easy to keep track of it that way. So, um, uh, using fairly standard uh, uh, methods, we turned it into a, a GFF3 format file for each one of the each one of the different sorts of modifications. And uh, Sarah Keegan is right there. Uh, generated a, uh, a MongoDB NoSQL database containing the information, and has constructed a uh, application programming interface that will allow people to go in and check their codons to, be, to see what sort of amino acid variants will be caused by the, the variant that they, that they uh, propose or that they found. And this is just a summary of the number of uh, bases that have been mapped uh, by particular modification. So as you can see, there's the usual asymmetry between serine and threonine phosphorylation and uh, in terms of numbers and uh, tyrosine phosphorylation, acetylation, and a, uh, uh, a somewhat larger number than I expected for uh, ubiquit ubiquitination, but that's because there have been some uh, really very good deep studies done recently on ubiquitination. So it, uh, 
even though you don't often see it in, um, in normal studies, in these ubiquination pull-down studies, they get a large number of uh, ubiquination sites. Yes? Yes, and uh, we. Is there any way to, to uh, try to, to. Is there a data set for some searching of the pseudocytomide allowing it on, on, on license to, to, to get a to feed into the water to figure out if it's. I, if I, al I always do that. Uh, normally, on average, I reject somewhere between 20 and 25 percent of the publicly available data just because of that. Either uh, iodoacetamide generated errors, uh, urea generated errors, which are all over the place. Uh, and occasionally I reject one because of viral contamination. Often I keep the viral contamination because it interests me. <laughs> but that's, that's also very common these days, particularly with no samples at the moment. But yeah, I'm, I'm very much uh, aware of all of the various types of artifacts that can show up. In fact, normally what's, what's done in an automated manner is when data comes in, it's, it's checked with about five different sets of common uh, 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 artifacts, possibilities to check to see whether any of them are there and whether the, the amounts are high enough to cause a rejection. And I'm particularly careful with the ubiquitination stuff, because as you said, uh, the, the change you get 114 is just two uh, iodoacetamide modifications, the carboxyl demethylations. So I hope that was sufficiently technically geeky for the, <laughs> for the people who don't work in the lab. but. Uh, one of, one of the problems of dealing with mass spec style proteomics information for either variants or PTMs is there are a lot of ways you can add up to a particular mass and you have to be pretty darn careful that you're getting the right ones. So with that, I'd like to uh, thank my collaborators here at NYU Chibi, David Fenu and Sarah Keegan, uh, my colleagues from the Human Proteome Project, the uh, chromosome I guess it's 19 group that, that I, 17, sorry, that I work with, Gil Oman, Bill Hancock, Mike Snyder, and all of their, their students, and my collaborators at the University of Manitoba, John Wilkins, John Portens, and uh, Ping Zhao Hu. So thank you very much, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Any questions for Ron? So I think you, you said something like in, in the global the global frequency of phosphorylation was zero point nine percent or something like that about one percent is that right? Yeah, in in sort of a normal proteomic study. Well, so so I think in our lab. So are you mixing together the data sets that have been rich for fossil peptides? No, that's, that's really? it, it, it can be quite variable uh, because, of course, um, you know, fossil peptides are very sensitive to being pulled out of, uh, out of solution by any non-passivated surface in the chromatography. So if you've got any little bit of metal, or even if you haven't, uh, even if you don't regularly passivate the, chromatography, that can go down to zero very easily. So depending on how you, you know, groups that use a lot of, of um, casein, they tend to uh, have a, uh, a better time getting uh, phosphopeptides through their chromatography on a regular basis because everything's already got casein stuck to it. You know, it's got the phosphorylated peptides from casein stuck to it. It's a bit of a nuisance because you see all these casing peptides, but you, you're more likely to see phosphopeptides from an ordinary uh, you know, mud pit run or a, a long chromatography That's run. That's very interesting because in our lab, I, I think that if we see 20,000 peptides, maybe two or three will be 
pastorally and, and in normal, you know, unless we rich. Yeah. But the rest of the world sees 1% of the of high school population. Uh, so yeah. More or less. Okay. Yeah. Got it. So, right. Well, I mean, the rest of the world probably sees something like <coughs> th there's a dichotomy. <laughs> there are those who see, you know, a couple of percent and those who don't see any. Yes. So, so that's oh. really the, the, the song part. So, uh, so for some of these data that you're showing, so what is your bottom stone rate? Is that 1% also? Uh, usually, I try to keep it well below that, uh, more like 0.1 or 0 0.01. So, so I was thinking that was having a data set, like a very global data set, there are things that are easy to identify, there are things that are not so easy to identify. Yes. So you might be starting to scratch the bottom. And also, I was wondering about uh, when you look. So, so I, I can understand. So, if you're looking of, of, uh, of similar type of phenotype, for example, in a proper, proper in which study where let's say 90% are phosphorylated phenotypes, there are of course different things is, is, is even when you compare. But but how how do you handle it when you're looking for? So how do you handle the what stopper rates or or, or, or or validation actually not what stopper rate validation but when you look at these SNPs? Uh, because so, so you're kind of having a lot of peptides are just matching okay, but then you're suddenly having some peptides that can match to whatever. Sure. Well, that's that's where having a lot of data comes in. Yeah. Uh, because uh, we've got such a large volume of data, you can't, well, you know, the, the random things happen at random, so they have a tendency to just sort of form a, a broad underlying noise distribution. There's certainly uh, kind of funny ways you can add masses up that, that uh, are different than that. But if you have a lot of um, observations of it, you can actually start to look at the distributions of scores that you get, the, uh, the parent ion charge states that you get, and actually look for consistency within the, in the spectrum. So you, uh, you have a lot more uh, tools available to you to discard those things, and that's what I try pretty hard to do. So it, 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 it is a serious problem because there is that tendency to you know, go down to the lowest possible signals, and particularly if you're looking for something rare, it, it becomes challenging. But that's, in a lot of cases, we're just having that large amount of, of information considered. <coughs> Or, or it makes it easier, and, and that way you can use that information to validate any results that you get. You know, you can directly compare the spectra and see if they're similar. Yeah. Okay. Well, cool. Why is the, uh, you show the, the working uh, uh, cycle for the natural uh, data by looking into the uh, uh, and uh, so after you reprocess other people's data, uh, how many of the Oh, I mean, it really de it very much depends on the on the data set. Uh, for some types of data, it's uh, it's not very much. Usually, I mean, the the biggest additions that you get are you know things like deamidation, uh, more detailed look at phosphorylations, uh, the all of the uh, the variance and lower abundance uh, PTMs. They usually add up to like ten percent addition, but uh, but the you know since they have biological consequence, they're they're worth going after. Yeah. Second question is uh, that we incorporate all these uh, uh, variations, so we have we need to send the data into your website to the search. We can also do this in my lab. We download your or whatever that incorporate the part of the schedule uh, to the search. So that's the it, uh, I mean, you, you probably, uh, in order to take advantage of it, you need the, uh, the matched FASTA files and the annotation files. But if you're using Scaffold, um, and I haven't actually done it, but since all you'd have to do is change a couple of specifications in one of the, uh, in one of the files, and it should do it for you. 
like I said, I haven't done it with scaffold, but I mean, if you want, the scaffold guys are very, uh, very approachable. I'm sure I can uh, talk to them and figure out how to get it done. Yes. Uh, Mr. Minister, at the beginning, but you did mention G was that is right and multi variation. So, did you take the uh, chance to, for example, take uh, just a few five per board and, and take samples, annotate that, map that in comparison to controllers, and then compare the pathways to, to, to each other where you have the aberrations there? Did you do that? No, we haven't done that yet. But it's feasible, this approach. You would yes. Say. Uh, no, I, until I've actually fooled around with it, I wouldn't want to make a comment on that. Uh, I didn't quite catch the very end of that. Could you repeat the question? Uh, potentially, yes. It, uh, that's not something I've really spent any time looking at, though. But but potentially the information's there. Uh, well, the way, I mean, in terms of the uh, the annotation file approach that I use, I, I only use the missense variants. For splicing variants, uh, I actually use separate entries for each one of the uh, of the proteins. So I I, I normally use the ensemble uh, set of proteins, which has about I guess about a hundred thousand. Uh, splice variants out of the 20,000 genes. So norm, on average, I'm testing roughly five splice variants per gene. But the, using the approach I'm using, that would be the best way to do it, to have a, a separate protein entry when you've got a, a significantly different protein sequence. The, the only, using the annotation approach that I'm using at the moment, the only uh, possibilities are a... Uh, a missense variant or a deletion. Well, it it turns out it's really not very many um, additional calculations. Uh, at three million, that's about the same as. Uh, the number of additional calculations you do for something like tyrosine oxidation, I mean, uh, tryptophan oxidation. It, it doesn't really perturb the calculation very much, so you can use any of the standard methods that you, you might want to try. Be well, I mean, if you're, using, if you're using something like a reverse database system, uh, then uh, you would uh, have a have additional, you know, you'd have the appropriate uh, reversed numbers in the, uh, for the variant coordinates on the protein level. Um, I use a different sort of statistical approach where I use a, um, uh, why am I, a survival function approach where I construct uh, experimental survival functions for each one of the for each one of the peptides and keep track of all the scores that are given to a particular spectrum by all of the peptides that it gets checked against, and then use that to model the statistical uh, confidence for the for the peptide. 
So no more questions, let's thank Juan again. And yes, I did bring the weather from Canada. <laughs>